you were to launch a subject, won't launch a product, what could you support at the end of the day? Um, there's the, you know, the business model. You know, it, are you a diversification, unification model? What is your operational mode? Uh, and tying it to that, you don't want to do something that is so abstracted from what you do in core business that it becomes distractive and disruptive to your business. Customer demands, what are they looking for? What do your competitors have? You know, those are, are key things that you need to ask when you start looking at what exactly do I want to build? What net effect do I want to create at the end of the day? Um, you know, is it ROI? Is it better customer satisfaction? Some of the things that Steph touched on. Uh, what else? Anything else you can think of on why you would want to build a solution? You know, thinking hardware, software, total solution, uh, you know, soup to nuts. What, what do you think people would want? Make life easier. <laughs> Make life easier. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so if they had more information, they could automate more things. Yeah, very true, yeah. So we see that a lot. Actually, that's one of the highest ROIs, uh, the trivial thing. So if you don't know what's happening out 10 miles away at a site, off-site. Uh, you, so you send a guy in a truck, and you're paying that guy so much an hour, and you're paying so much for that truck, and you're paying so... If you knew what was happening out there you know, over the Internet, you could bring it back into a back-end system or a cloud-based system, visualize that data, and actually extract the value of that. Uh, so it's a pretty big ROI on that. So the planning, so planning on, on, on the building is, is very big. You know, many times we'll, we'll go into a conversation and, and you know, we'll get past that concept. I've got this idea of what I want to build. Uh, one of the first questions I have is, you know, what, are, what are the marketing requirements you know, from an engineering standpoint? What are the marketing requirements to back into the technical specifications? Uh, what are the use cases? You know, that lets me know, if, have you actually done a business plan to put this together? Because there has to be solid business logic behind any solution you bring to market. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't work. Just the, the cool factor won't uh, do well outside of uh, some of the, <laughs> you know, some of the, the, the group funding. Um, so the budget versus cost. You really have to plan this out. What, what are you anticipating the value to be? What do you anticipate the cost to be? Looking at all of those things, is this something strategically you want to pursue as a company? Life expectancy, the future proofing of it. So if you're looking for something that has an economic useful life of two years, you would probably look at a, maybe a, a current technology or, or very mature technology that's lower cost. But if you're looking at something that's maybe five to seven, ten years out, you'll want to look to a technology that, that is going to have longevity to it. It's going to future-proof your solution into uh, greater detail. We'll talk about network, uh, you know, the network longevity and some of the technology and longevity with that. Scalability, you know, uh, I've run into a lot of situations where they think I can support this up to X amount or, you know, or my infrastructure can support this. Or they are looking at maybe a, a technology like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and when you start looking at deploying that and introducing user error you know, in, into the equation where it doesn't need to be, you're, you're introducing uh, actually faults and, and, and things into an equation that don't need to necessarily be there. You look at how you can scale and deploy tens, thousands, you know, up to millions of devices. You know, I, I think there's a pretty strong case for what cellular can do in that space. Uh, the time to market, how do you reduce it? When we look over at that table over there, there's a lot of pieces. Um, you know, Brandon is here from, from Nimblelink. Uh, Brandon, if you raise your hand. Um, so Nimblelink is, is a manufacturer of, uh, based out of Minneapolis that, that, that does a pre-certified socket modem that plugs in you know, via an XP form factor, very small form factor, very good you know, embedded modem solution. So if you want to get to market rather quickly, spin a board quickly, not have to go through certification. That's really you know, what, what that is. So your time to market becomes crucial. Uh, do you need to do a proof of concept and roll something very quickly? You can do it that, that way uh, and get there. Your, your global deployment is another piece. It, are you looking globally or are you looking domestic? Um, those are some of the questions that you have to ask because that determines your technology. And, and it also kind of determines what you do for um, an infrastructure from a, a software standpoint. You're probably going to look at using multiple data centers because of latency, you know, so you, and, and also uh, the sovereignty of data within countries becomes uh, important when you, we start looking global. So security, this is a big one. 
uh, you hear about cars getting hijacked with their Wi-Fi. They don't have you know, uh, any infrastructure on the backside. So how do you build security in depth or defense in depth in IoT? That becomes a, you know, a big question. There are a lot of tools that you can, you can put into place that I, I think we, and we'll touch on, on many of these today in the talk track, but uh, that's definitely a consideration that has to be baked in. It can't be bolted on. You have to think about it from the get-go. What are you going to do to address the security risk? And anything that you do out there, the reality is you deploy an IoT solution, that becomes a new threat vector. That becomes your new corporate boundary. So most people don't consider that. They think it's ancillary, it's not going to impact, but it is a threat vector that you have to address at some point in time or have it tied down so that people cannot get to that or get to your infrastructure through that endpoint. So what else, what other considerations when you're looking at this planning stage? What, are, what else can you think of that, that you might want to include on this list? Yeah. Topic to bring up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, and we always say it's hardware, but a solution is is it's really a collection of core competencies. You you take your hardware that that is one core, and your firmware that is on that, and then your software that creates the the value at the end of the day. It, it allows you to visualize it and take that abstracted data, in and putting into a meaningful context. So I, I love it that we have kind of a mix of people here, you know, that are software, hardware, whatever interest level it is. IoT is, is really kind of a holistic picture of, of you know, all of those things working together to make sense or, and to pull in other data into it. You know, IoT is, is really that flattening event of data where you can get put into a horizontal context and derive greater value from it. So that's, that's one of the things that excites me about the space. Uh, so we talked a little bit about longevity. So uh, who here has heard of network sunsets? People turning down 2G, 3G networks. Um, so made big news a, a few years ago and, and some of uh, our network competitors are going through that right now. Uh, Refarming just uh, our insatiable appetite for <laughs> unstructured data, you know, video, pictures, all of those things have created the need to uh, take spectrum holdings that were previously dedicated to uh, legacy technologies and refarm those to LTE. Um, Verizon's been very lucky in that space. We, we actually invested very heavily uh, early on in, in, L, in spectrum leases. Uh, so we had a lot of spectrum, additional spectrum. So we're able to commit to our customers that you know, through the end of the decade, we will keep in the same or better state our, our CDMA network. So that's your 2G, 3G. So you'll hear it referred to as 1XRTT or EBDO. Um, 4G, of course, is the future, LTE. That's long-term evolution, um, if, if you're not familiar with that. So what's in your cell phone today is probably a category three or a category four LTE, what they refer to. And that really uh, denotes the, the specification uh, of that. So like a uh, phone, it has a theoretical capability of 100, 100 megabits of data down in the downstream and 50 megabits on the upstream. Um, when we look to uh, IoT or machine to machine or uh, a solution that uses very little data, it's significant overkill. <laughs> You don't need that type of speed. You, you don't need real-time access. You don't have a real-time application. So when we look at um, the next iteration, this was actually part of the original specification in 2008 for LTE. So 4G LTE, the Cat1, has anybody heard of Category 1 LTE? Perfect. Um, so that is a move from, you know, to about a 50% less complex, uh, L, you know, from a module standpoint. Uh, so, and the data throughput is, is about uh, 10%. It's 10 megabit down, 5 megabit up, theoretical. So probably closer to what you would see in a 3G type of speed. Uh, it's constricted from a data standpoint. We really don't want to see a ton of data. Um, you know, optimally, we, you know, more like a telematics type of, of engagement where you're sending data back from, say, an engine or sensor array uh, back to a backend system or cloud. Uh, so, so you know, this is lower data consumption. But uh, that is the future. So how would you migrate you know, to a new technology you know, when you look at the end of networks, the legacy networks, CDMA, moving to LTE, that has a very, very long lifespan, talking into the late, late 20s, uh, possibly into the 30s, that that technology will be viable. Any? Yeah. Really quick. yeah. Um, so most of the telemetry 
battery machine to machine devices that are out there today, would you say they're on the 2G network? They are. Network? They are. Okay. It's, a, it's a low cost of entry. Um, the nice thing about this, uh, when, when we start looking at 4G LTE Cat 1, it actually is about at parity with the cost of a module that is, is a 2G module. So if you wanted to develop for LTE, the module cost is about the same. Certification cost is a little bit different. We'll cover that a little bit later on in the slides. But uh, you know that is coming down as well. We're working to reduce test cases for machine to machine IoT uh, to get it to a reasonable level. <coughs> so when you're planning, do you want to build it or do you want to buy it? Oh, question, yes. So uh, just a quick question. So like yeah. my background, one of those like software folks that this whole conversation is new to me. Um, can, when you're talking about cost, uh, I work with a lot of startups in the area. Can you, can you kind of share like what some of those numbers are like as you're going through it, like some of the certification costs? Yeah. Yeah, that's a one million. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit, the, the cost of certification and, and kind of the, the endpoint cost. Everything is coming down. I mean, everything follows, when, when you look at it, to IT in general, everything is following Moore's Law. Everything is getting halved and halved and halved, but things are getting faster and faster and faster. So it, it's an exciting time to be in this space because that means you can connect more things for the same amount of money. <laughs> so, I think that's what we were really seeing yeah. that Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, referring back to the table and to Brandon, <laughs> too, you know, because uh, you know this becomes an important conversation you need to have internally. What is your deployment structure? Do you do you want to build something a module down design, and go through that and go through the certification process, or do you want to get to market rather quickly, build something, plug it in, uh, or you know, are you going to look to an external device? Do you just need USB access? Which there are a number of devices that do that as well. Um, when we look at the modules, there, there are different form factors, you know, uh, different arrays, different <coughs> configurations. You, you're going to see um, you know, a couple of, of them are, are board to board. Those are more legacy uh, type of connectors. Um, a lot of them will be uh, M.2 or mini PCIe. Uh, some, some will, most of them are going to be surface mount. Um, so do you want to go through that surface mount uh, process? Do you have enough volume to offset what your NRE is on the front end? Uh, do you have enough volume at the end of the day to, for that to make financial sense? And that's one of the things that we sit down and work through many times with our customers. You know, what is the, the most viable path for you to pursue when you start looking at cellular, if you want to embed it into a current system or new system? Uh, so here's kind of a breakdown on the hardware options. So we usually look at these volumes, you know, 10 to 500. Um, you, you probably want to buy something. You probably want to buy something off the shelf. Uh, it's pre-built, ready to go. Uh, fits your use case uh, to a point that, that uh, you wouldn't look at building something. The next would be the embedded modem. Uh, with the embedded modem, you're going to have a little more cost. You're going to have to build a PCB or respin what you have because you're going to have to create uh, you know, traces and access and, and supply power to that, that uh, embedded modem. Um, so you know, this is you know, cost per unit, 800 to 200. Now that is you know, in probably quantities of one many times. Uh, so in larger quantities, that that price goes down. Um, but this can get you to market in weeks. Uh, you know, the the time in production is maybe three months. We, that's pretty typical for what we see. Uh, it's a very good way to, uh, to pursue. Um, when we look at doing the module down design, these have really dropped through the floor. This used to be about 30, 40 grand a few years back. You know, for a 1x RTT, so something that that is very, very <laughs> exceptionally slow by our standards today would have cost a mint just a few years back. Um, same thing with EVDO. The 3G would fall back to 2G, very expensive. Um, LTE, this actually has gone through a price drop now too. What we're seeing now uh, with CAT1 uh, has impacted the pricing of some of the other uh, volume of, of LTE testing. So we've reduced the test cases for IoT uh, down to about 20 to 30,000 at this point. So 
uh, it's very good uh, from that standpoint. But you know, five to six thousand, uh, that's probably down to four to five now. We keep on reducing the test cases. We keep on seeing the prices lower. Things are making it through the labs faster, reduces the, the cost uh, to the developer at the end. But you have to have pretty high volume to offset this. This doesn't include what you paid the engineer to develop your board. This doesn't include what you paid you know, for that production run for your, for your pilot. Uh, so you have to have pretty good volume and pretty good opportunity to pursue that. And just a note with full disclosure, um, Verizon does not uh, carry this stuff in our inventory. Nope. The reason we're giving you ranges is because you need to work directly with the, the OEM, module manufacturer, et cetera. But the great thing about working with Verizon on some of this stuff is that we have a very large partner portfolio and can help put you in touch with the right people um, that can get you um, to yeah. The, the best thing about it is if you take the, the right-hand side of this, that's what we charge you. <laughs> we don't charge. Uh, we're a free resource, so if you have questions, you need answers, you come to us. That, Verizon provides us to the market for that uh, to help you and assist you as you build things and go forward. So this is the eye chart. <laughs> uh, other things to consider. Uh, so there will be a test later. Um, yeah. <laughs> after the intermission, so uh, study up. But these are some of the other questions that you're, you're gonna wanna look at, you know. Uh, what environment are you going to operate that in? Does it have specific use cases for that? Are uh, the domestic versus global, is it North America or is it all of the world? Uh, the form factor, you know, how large of a module can you stand? How large of an embedded modem do you wanna utilize? Um, the bandwidth and data management. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we start looking at how you thin out data levels. Uh, so the protocols you choose from both an application and transport standpoint, those matter. Um, are you going to manufacture it in-house? Are you going to outsource? Now, the feature requirements, uh, are you going to have GPS on board? Are you looking for it integrated into the cellular module or do you want to have it separate? What other radios are you looking at integrating? You know, there's a lot of, of buzz around new and different radios. And the wireless sensor network, I think, is going to explode. Uh, as far as an industry and sending that data back to a common gateway or sending it back to centralized gateways along a course. Uh, and you know, how are you going to take advantage of that with cellular backhaul? Uh, and there's some other things that, that, that uh, are impacting or impending. One of the things we didn't talk about on the network slide you know, before we get too far down the road, um, what happens after category one? So down the road, there's a specification that's going out before the, the, the uh, standards body, the 3GPP, it's called Category M or, or MTC. It's, it's part of Rev, Rev 13. So once we have that, MTC stands for machine type communication. It's actually a segregation of networks, so it's dedicated frequency that, that goes to machine to machine. It's a one megabit up, one megabit down theoretical throughput. The huge thing is the power saving mode of the modules that they're specifying. Uh, the other piece is being segregated, it, it uh, becomes hopefully lower cost. Some of the, some of the things that, that we see from a module standpoint, it's another 50% less complex than CAT1. They're talking eight to $12, possibly as low as $6 for modules, depending on the volume. Uh, we're looking at certification costs that are kind of at parity with what we saw for 2G and 3G. That's, that's where we're looking to go to. Um, so that's going to change everything, I think. When we start looking at having a scalable solution that you can secure, that you can do all of these things with, and being pretty much at parity with other RF technology from a module standpoint. So it, it's gonna get very interesting very quickly. So then that's a, probably about 18 to 24 months out. So this brings us up to the beer break. So <laughs> the break has concluded, <laughs> but I think there's still beer for afterwards. So um, proof of concept, this is, uh, uh, one of the stages we get to, when we start looking at that, it's going to be ugly. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, it's going to be a, a functional design of what you want to have. So it's a, a proving out that use case, proving out that you can develop something. Uh, you want to get it on the cellular network. What's the easiest way to do that? What's the fastest way to do that? Uh, and perform those basic functions. Maybe you want to get buy-in from leadership or you want to get funding. You, know, you want to have something that you can go and say, this is, here it is, this is my idea, this is how we're going to build it, how we're going to get it done. But it's not going to be a finished design. It's probably going to be just an open, probably a dev board, might be a, you know, a single spin of a board, but it's not going to be the end uh, result. Uh, 
once you have that support, you know, you're good to move forward. But until you have that, uh, usually it's, it's a, a pet project. So what other things can you think of? So I guess my question is for a proof of concept, I know some yep. companies when uh, developers are developing uh, their hardware, companies will actually provide either the module or whatever yep. an assurance that they're going to get a lot of other modules or services yep. sent off to do cell phone networks like Verizon, same thing? Well, we don't manufacture any modules. All of them, the, the yeah. Service, well. The Sometimes it depends. You know, sometimes there are seeding functions, but uh, typically at high volumes, uh, high volume commitments. Uh, that's when we start seeing dollars start being distributed back for that. Uh, there are a lot of startups, <laughs> uh, especially today. There's a lot of innovation. I love it, uh, but uh, you know, I always uh, kind of characterize the, all of the the startup movement and IoT and. Because uh, there are a lot of things that are built out there that, that if they build them are going to be very cool. But it's kind of like my swimming ability. There's uh, a lot of motion. It's just not a lot of forward. <laughs> so, you know, I would drown if I ever ended up in a, in a river without an inner tube. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the problem with it is having so many people that are chasing it, having so many people that are interested, we found companies are starting to pull back a little bit, actually, and say, you know, hey, show me what you're going to do, show me a volume commitment, show me your business plan before they're going to commit resources back to you. Uh, it's not unheard of that they will, but it's not common anymore that they're just gonna open up the floodgates of free stuff. Um, so any other thoughts on what you would think from a proof of concept? All right, so development kits, so a couple of different things here. So, so one is a development kit that uh, you know, utilizes kind of that, that pre-certified uh, uh, modem. The other one is a, a module evaluation kit. So there's two different, uniquely different things. When we start looking at uh, proof of concept, so, so the one on the, on the top side, that's going to have a microcontroller whether it's 32-bit or 8-bit or even a 16-bit, you know, no matter what it is, it, you're going to be able to program to that. You're going to be able to pull in uh, I.O., whether it's, it's digital or analog, and, and pull in sensor data and create that full proof of concept. Now, when we look at the, uh, the one below, which is more of a, a module application or a module evaluation kit, that's more testing the functionality of that module, making sure it fits the use case that you have built out. Does it have all of the feature functionality that you want? Um, are, is all of the I.O. exposed that you need from the module? Does it have those capabilities? So those are, are going to be important distinctions. And that's one of the things that we can assist with as well. You know, are you better served to spend the money on a module evaluation kit, which is somewhat expensive, uh, or, or go the, the uh, more cost effective route? And, and one that gets you a, a lot of data uh, that, that you may need for that, that senior leadership buy-in. Prototyping, my favorite thing. So half of my family room is now dedicated to prototyping. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, much to, yeah, my, my, uh, my, my wife and friends tell me I'm raising nerds. Uh, so, but <laughs> it's okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so custom board design, yeah, I, I, I came home with a, a PCB router um, after the last bonus, and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, I, I bought something, I found a deal. So <laughs> it was on sale. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a disturbed hobbyist. I, I, you know, you know, not only do I do this for work, but I, I, I'm a, a very big enthusiast. I love to build things and build things with my kids at home. So uh, it's a lot of fun. But uh, so we're looking here at custom board design. So uh, you know, you need, you know, somebody with RF engineering experience, you know, typically depending on, on what you're wanting to build and how you're building it. Uh, module experience, you know, the, that future proofing piece of it, which we talked about. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to hit on too, when we start looking at pre-certified embedded modems, um, you know, there's a higher cost to it because the engineering's been done, all, everything's been vetted out. But with that premium, 
comes the ability to be modular. So when we talk about future-proofing end-of-life on networks, you're able to pop in a new technology, not have to respin a board. You're able to update your firmware, not necessarily throw that PCB away. So it, it becomes uh, a unique value and a unique value proposition of, of employing those. And, and that's another reason we, that we, we talked about what kind of that break-even point of, of module down versus embedded modem, that increases that also because there's a higher, higher value associated with modularity. Uh, and we've seen that from, from some use cases as well. Um, power management. So are you going to have power where you're going to locate it? You know, uh, is it going to be in the middle of nowhere with nothing? Uh, are you going to do uh, some sort of, of energy harvesting? Is it going to be solar? Is it going to be motion activated? Is there going to be temper you know, temperature differential a generation of electricity, that thermoelectric generation? Um, micro generation with a little, I, I saw a design with a little windmill on it. Uh, so as you're going down the road, when the truck hits 45 miles an hour, the little turbine kicks in and actually recharges your battery for a telematics application. Um, same thing with the uh, data usage, that, that has to be a consideration at this point. Uh, we start thinking prototype, we start thinking that relevant data that we want to bring back into a back-end system, how are we transmitting it? Does it need to be always reliable? Does it need to be somewhat reliable or can it be best efforts? You know, what's going to give you the, the best value for your investment and what you're going to spend to support that solution going forward? Firmware strategy, very important. How are you going to update it when it's in the field? How are you going to reach out to that device and make sure that it has the latest and greatest? Or if you want to push a modification, how is that going to get accomplished? Is it going to necessarily self-heal from a, a architectural standpoint within the software? How are you going to build that? You know, uh, I know a lot of, from taking a poll of the room, a lot of people are, are I, I'm assuming more on the application development side, are there any embedded engineer? Like an embedded, okay. <laughs> yeah, so so when we look at at that, you know, it's we, we call that you know fun, <laughs> with a capital F. Uh, <laughs> when we get to the firmware, um, that's what that stands for. But uh, uh, firmware is is its own unique animal at times, you know, and it depends on what you want to use. I mean, are you going specific? Are you going to employ something that's readily available, C C plus plus, or is it going to be a custom real time operating system that you're going to employ in there? It really depends on the end use case uh, and what strategy you employ. What other things can you think of that, that are going to be important at this phase when we start looking at those, that kind of line items? Anything else you can think of that you would want to include at that point? Yes, yep, environmental. Um, yeah, so your enclosure. Yeah, that, that becomes uniquely important. It, aesthetic as well as functional. You know, so does it need to be IP rated? Well, hey, ben, ben laughs and snickers, but you know, does it have to be pretty? And, uh, and at this point, yes, it does. <laughs> so <laughs> when we're at this stage of it, it's, we're no longer making a proof of concept that can just be you know, wires sticking out of a breadboard uh, hooked into things, um, which I've done plenty of those. <laughs> it has to be, at this point, something that you could go to market with, uh, something that you could attract investors. Yes? I would like them to have done that uh, uh, really prior to buying anything right. and investing a lot of time. It needs to be vetted out. The business case has to be there. Um, I, I say this time and time again in my role at Verizon and, and, and in others, you know, in a lot of the meetups that I, that I attend and, and that I, I organize, there always has to be some function, some improvement tied to you know, that. It, it doesn't have to be a monetary ROI. But there has to be an ROI. You know, it can't just be for the sake of and be successful or be widely deployed. So from a B2B standpoint, of course, yes, it does have to be tied to some level of self-improvement uh, for the company that it's, it's being built for. But um, if they haven't done that at that point, I've led them astray. <laughs> or or you know, I've not made it. Uh, as firm of a point that, that there has to be a business plan in play. There has to be something tied to it. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it's really 
uh, you're looking for an investment uh, by doing no research whatsoever. So, yep. Uh, anything else? Any other things that you could think of that you would want to throw into this at this point? All right, moving into considerations. So uh, when you're looking at the prototyping, how you transport the data becomes important. I said always reliable or best efforts, and there, there are some variations in between depending on how you employ them. But speed of transfer. So does, does it need to be always reliable, somewhat reliable? Does it need to be high data traffic? Those are the things you, you'll have to ask on this. Can it drop a few packets and it's not going to kill the end solution, essentially? Can some things get lost if there's congestion on a network and you still be okay with it? Um, you know, this becomes important when we start looking at over, overhead. So this type of scenario where you know, you're sending a 105 byte payload every four minutes, minimal data. We're, we're talking sensor readings with headers, <laughs> you know, essentially. Maybe, maybe a GPS coordinate and a few sensor readings. You know, with every four minutes, that calculates into a lot of times <laughs> you know, per month. You know, we, we start looking at what does that mean at the end? 105 bytes compiled into a monthly, about 1.5 megabytes per month, which isn't bad. Three mega, megabytes higher uh, for TCP. So that's all overhead. But if you need that reliability, if it has to be, there are ways that you can architect it so that maybe you don't have to send every four minutes. Maybe you only create from a firmware strategy standpoint, it's exception based. If it falls outside of parameters X and Y, then you trigger an alert. Otherwise, you just log the data and send once a day. So you're only paying for the overhead one time, but it's a much larger data session, but it's always reliable data at that point. If you need you know, reports every minute or every two minutes, every five minutes, Sometimes UDP is fine, because if you miss that data set, it's not going to skew what you have at the end. Uh, you're probably going to have a full enough uh, set of data to, to fulfill what your end goal is, what you want to accomplish. So those are considerations. Um, here, let me go back to this. One of the other things over the top of this, uh, the application protocol. So if, if you're looking at coming from a, a wired environment and you're saying, oh, you know, I can use RESTful, you know, APIs or a RESTful API. I can, I can do the get, post, put, delete over HTTP. Please don't. <laughs> it, uh, we, we, we find time and time again that, that using something that's thinner, that's purpose-built, is, is usually a better way to do that, unless you're doing that, that uh, you know, kind of log drop session at the end of a day or end of a period of time. Um, HTTP is awesome across wireline, you know, and, and if you're using HTTPS to, you know, for that security factor, it's great. But if you can do something like CoAP, uh, you know, which is the constrained uh, application protocol, you know, built for those environments. Um, you know, when we start looking at um, TCP, you know, MQTT uh, becomes important, the multiple queue uh, telemetry transport. Um, that, that's important. It's kind of that pub sub, but it's very thin over the top side of it. Provides that reliability you wouldn't have to have with HTTP. Same thing with, with uh, when we start looking at co-app over UDP, very thin. You know, I think it's eight bytes on the header size, but it gives you some additional functionality. It gives you the ability to take UDP and say, did I receive that entire checksum at the other end from a header standpoint? If I didn't, can you resend the packet? You can send back, you can kind of validate from that point. So th that becomes an important consideration when you're architecting. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, do you know what kind of frame size we're dealing with when we're talking about like, wireless layers? Like a maximum transmission unit, you mean? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, it's normal MTU, uh, 1,500. It, but if you're putting like a, a, a you know, essentially uh, any security on that, you're, you're probably going to want to back it off to about 1,430 <coughs> bytes. So regular segmentation like you would over any IP network. But once we start looking at an IPsec tunnel, if you're going to secure it, and we'll talk about that in a little bit with security, um, you're going to have to drop that down a little bit. It's going to impact your MTU uh, a little bit. But you can set that from the device or set that from a network standpoint at, at you know, the switches, uh, depending on what you want to implement. IPsec is going to take up about 56 bytes uh, per session. So uh, you want to account for that and probably reduce your MTU. Yeah, we actually ran into an issue at one point where it wasn't uh, segmenting. Yeah, go, yeah. yeah uh, are you going to 
to talk about IP46 and you know, how they get spilled into the devices. And the IPv6, uh, yeah, transformation, yeah, because right now everything, the world is still running IPv4, but, but everything on the backdrop is starting to go 6 low pan and IPv6 uh, for that. Not necessarily in the cellular world. Eventually it will be there, but I think we're waiting for w wider adoption of it. Uh, before we'll roll it out internally, um, you know, we run more from an IPv6 standpoint, but the rest of the world is IPv4, so we nat it back out uh, many times. So um, it's it's not native. You know, we we couldn't we wouldn't be able to use that in a real world environment at this point. Uh, you can only use it on closed loop networks. So you know, wireless sensor networks are great for six low pan or IPv6. Uh, so you look at LoRa, you look at uh, Zigbee, even um, you know. It, well, in, in the uh, uh, Bluetooth in the 4.1 spec, it's, you, know, you can actually go 6 low pan or IPv6 with Bluetooth low energy now. So, I mean, that's, that's an exciting you know, thing. Uh, they still haven't figured out meshing, but they figured out that piece. So you have an addressable system with a, a modulating, um, uh, modulating MAC address so people can't eavesdrop as easily with like the 4.1 spec. So, I mean, we're seeing some, some movement that way, but it's not widespread and it's not, the internet hasn't gone IPv6 yet even though we're out of addresses. <laughs> um, you know, but but uh, I think we will see that come to fruition, probably, I don't know, within the next th three years, maybe we'll see that because it, we're going to have to have it. Uh, I, 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 you know, eventually it's going to have to be forced upon us that, that we run to an IPv6 world, so. Yeah. Right. It may be easier to migrate to that. Yeah, well, exactly. When we start talking trillions of IP addresses and being able to hop back or daisy chain back across, you know, mesh networks, I, I think that's where it becomes uniquely useful. Um, and especially if you look at a closed loop system and being able to employ that. So um, I think that's going to be very exciting. So Verizon Innovation Program. Verizon actually runs a couple of innovation centers, one in Waltham, Massachusetts, one in San Francisco. So um, San Francisco's got a great view from the deck. I would rec highly recommend that one. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so it's, it, you know, this allows you to come in, look at uh, you know, devices that are being developed, mostly LTE, you know, the, the most cutting edge things, looking at air quality, some of the other, other aspects of, of development. Uh, really cutting edge, working with the engineers. So the engineers from Alcatel, Lucent, Ericsson, uh, they're housed at those facilities. So if you have questions about network and network operations, future uh, evolutions, they're great people to bounce it off of. So it's, it's just a, a neat experience for people who want to go in and, and have a granular discussion, but also have a thought provoking uh, tour and discussion and, and engage with other engineers. So it's, it's a, a nice thing that, that we've put together for that. Um, so. This is the production launch it thing. You know, so when we go to production, this is test it, certify it, launch it, manage it, support it. So uh, like I said, there will be a quiz later. Um, this is your certifications, FCC, which is your specific absorption rates, you know, making sure that you're not uh, making people glow. Uh, carrier certifications, data security, we'll hit on that. Uh, the manufacturing, so uh, you know, how are you going to manufacture that device? Who's going to do your enclosure? Who's going to spin your boards? Uh, who's going to provide that? The automatic provisioning, uh, so API sets and different things that you all work with, uh, you know, from a software standpoint. How does that fit into this? Technical support, and there are always other things. What else can you think of that you would want to look at from a production when you're going to launch and you're going to market with this? Documentation. Yeah, documentation, a absolutely. Making sure that you have everything set so when you do ship it, you don't have to take a phone call every time. Yeah, that's, that's definitely consideration. Yes. Conversation over here. How yeah. are you going from, you know, if you're a company that's manufacturing something, now you're going to manufacturing service, I've never built a customer annually or biannually or monthly before, what does that look like? And I think that's something. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Defects and how much you take care of warranties. Oh yeah, RMA is is huge. Warranty and returns. Absolutely. You have to have that structure in play. That that's why that business plan thinking it all the way through. Uh, so important. 
So this is welcome Brandon Hart. Brandon was a Brandon's actually a former uh, coworker of mine, so we left him on here. So, so, yeah, yeah, he, he's he's immortalized on this. So, um, <laughs> so uh, this is what our open development looks like. If you want to do a module down type of design, this is a portal that you would see uh, once you get to that level that you want to build and you want to certify. We would start working through this particular um, set of. Uh, I, I guess test criteria you know, would be probably the, the best way to put it. So you register the, the device. Um, you know, this is kind of the, the progression of, of certification. So device lockdown call, the DLD, testing authorization. It's in testing, the post results, test pass, and device pass. In a 2G and 3G device, this can take two to three days you know, to get through testing and to get reviewed be another two to three days and to get to certification maybe another two or three days. It's very quick anymore. Once we have the test results back from the lab, it usually flies through. Um, for GLT, sometimes takes a little bit longer, depending on what you run into at the, at the lab. Are there any failures or any things that require retesting at that point? So sometimes it, it does take longer. And if you have additional radios in, involved in the process. So there is a whole set of requirement and test plan documentation that, that's out there. Uh, there is what's called a test entry uh, checklist or ch criteria checklist. Sorry, I just got it backwards. Uh, that document will define what the labs need to test for, and that will define what tests are engaged and what the cost will be. So th that's what they'll quote off of. They'll look at what does the device entail, how many tests do I have to do, and that's what really determines your lab time, determines your cost. So we've significantly reduced it and plan to reduce it even further. But you know, at this point, you know, um, the kind of the cost that I gave the, the general values, kind of where that's at, but anticipate those to uh, actually decline. So on this table back here, there is the uh, machine-to-machine device that we have a starter kit. It has a lot more detail around the open um, development initiative, specifically the portal and the different steps that you take from ideation all the way through to certification, as well on the back. To, um, where to go to this site, as well as some of the other links that yeah. John mentioned. So I would recommend grabbing one of these things. Yeah. Like and th that uh, little pamphlet also has our six uh, approved test labs. So all six of the labs can do LTE certification. Four of them can do CDMA, so the 2G and 3G certification. So, but those uh, labs are listed on there, and I think there are links to their websites as well. A lot of good resources in, in, in that particular little book. Uh, any questions on, on this? This is something that you would, if you engage in it, we would do a walkthrough of the site. Uh, so it probably will go a little bit slower than me clicking through. But well, please know at this point that you are going to have an NDA between yourself and your horizon, so your information is proprietary. Yeah. Um, so private network. When we talk about security, so one of the ways you can accomplish that, and I, some people refer to this as, uh, as security through obscurity. It, it, it is, but it isn't. You know, so what we do with private network is we take whatever your termination point is. If you want to go to the cloud, if you want to go to a backend system, we'll take from that server that you're terminating to, take subnet of private IP space that you're not utilizing anywhere else within your routing infrastructure, extend that out to the devices either static or dynamically. So that gives you the ability for bi-directional communication. So you can have mobile originated or mobile terminated communication. So bi-directional and also an IPsec tunnel with geographic diversity. So we have from one data center you know, over in one side of the country or one in the middle of the country coming into your backend system. So there's geographic redundancy. Uh, in case one fails, one will fail over. Primary and secondary tunnels, that all comes back into the backend system, uh, which can be cloud, it can be your back office, it can be your home computer. <laughs> if you have the proper infrastructure, we will terminate that IPsec tunnel to you. So it never traverses an untrusted network with your data. You know, you can't hack a private IP address because you can't see it. So that becomes very important when you're looking at deployment. Everything that's out there, even if it is a dynamic public, it's natted off of something. Even if it's natted IPv6, you can still find a way back to that device. You know, and hackers do. We see it all the time. We see a lot of traffic uh, from China. We see a lot of traffic from uh, other countries that, that are engaged in state-sponsored hacking <laughs> um, and people that are bored. We say that a lot. So 
Uh, sometimes it is inadvertent data consumption. Problem is, when somebody starts a denial of service or distributed denial of service, attacking an IP address, trying to get to the back end of that system, that's billable data <laughs> on any network, one cellular. So when we start looking at that, you want to get to a point where they can't see you, they can't hack you, they can't s send a distributed denial of service attack to you. You no longer have a threat vector. So that's why this is important. Um, so, any questions around how, how this operates at all? I know there's still beer left, so I, I don't expect many questions. <laughs> all right. Um, so when we start looking at how we manage devices in the field, th this becomes important as well. We offer with that, that uh, private network uh, what we call Machine to Machine Management Center, which is uh, it's a free service. It's a portal that you can go to which gives you a device list. It'll list the status, alarm status. You can set alerts, thresholds, uh, do reporting out of this feature so you know what those devices are doing in the field. What's the last time they connected to the network? Uh, you know, how much data did it consume in a period of time? Uh, did something go rogue? Can you, you can set a threshold and shut that device off before you incur a large overage. So this be becomes uniquely useful, especially when you take this from an API standpoint, integrate that into your system, integrate that across into your backend or your extranet or intranet. You can manage the devices, the connectivity remotely using this. You don't have to log into a portal or switch between screens. Um, you, know, you don't have to be on a swivel. You can have it all in one location through the APIs. Can you talk about that API? Do you know what yeah. kind of APIs? Yeah. Soap, uh, Soap XML available today uh, in about uh, probably towards the end of Q2, we'll have what we call ThingSpace uh, Manage, which there's sp ThingSpace Develop right now. If you look at Verizon, we're kind of trans transferring over. We have a portal called ThingSpace. So you, eventually you'll be able to actually abstract data from there. At this point, it's going to be managed. There'll be a RESTful set of APIs with some additional functionality as well. But with a, an NDA in place, uh, you can have access to uh, the SDK as well. So. So the, where this becomes important with the APIs, when we start looking at automation. So if you're going through a production line and, and see you have a barcoded module, it's going through and that, that MEID or IMEI is on that module, you can go through, scan it. Once it hits the end of that production line and hits the end of the certification testing, you can call, do an API call and it will actually go through the provisioning process automatically and put that device into production state into a deployable ready state. That becomes very important when you start looking at tens of thousands of units. You don't want to sit there and call it in every time. You don't want to upload a file every time. But if you can do an API call, it's automated it, and it will validate. It will send you a call back and let you know that it, it was successful in its validation. Yes? Zach's data is not actually billable at that point? It's only billable when it's... Well, it depends. Um, there are features that we can set up to, to enable that, usually for OEMs. Um, what we like to do is set up what's called a device setup feature, or you know, we attempt to do. It depends on the size, the volume, uh, what it is that you want. Uh, so for a period of time, we don't have to bill for data. We actually offset that or, or you know, we show it as a bill and a credit on the same invoice. But uh, you know, there still are a few fees that the government still wants their piece <laughs> when we talk about that. But, so there's still a little bit of cost, but, but it's called uh, device setup feature you know, for a reason. So that you have that time, that shelf life, to get from the end of the production line to wherever it's going to be installed at the end. It gives you a period of time that automatically sets to uh, a plan, a set plan, or, or a set, uh, after a set time period, or at a level of data consumption. So it can be automated from that standpoint also. Really? Yes. When it gets above a certain level, then it yep. Yeah, so it's uh, 60 kilobytes of data consumption, typically. It's, that's enough for you to send a ping out to the server let you know that's that it's alive. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, it lets you know that it validated, yeah. validated on the network that it's, it's service provisioned, uh, and that it can it can communicate over IP, and uh, it's, we also it's like up to 15 SMS messages. So if that's part of your provisioning process, you can test that as well. Um, so yeah, nice thing. Uh, so this is only one uh, use case for the APIs. There are many others. Um, lots of different things that you can do with it and, and fill into a backend system. This is a very limited uh, subset of what's available. And we're to the end. 
Yay.